The only reason I've come along tonight is that I've heard there's a guest compare. Because <laughs> uh, Tim's not here. I hope this new fellow's alright. Uh, no, I'll, 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 joking aside, Tim um, has asked me to compare this evening uh, for tonight's Babad Bar because he's away um, on holiday uh, and I've got a kind of funny, strange email that said we either cancelled or almost point two open brackets on the email you can see where this is going, can't you? Close brackets on the email. Uh, I find someone else to host it. Would you like to do it? At which point, um, it took me all of about two and a half seconds, I think, to think, yeah, I'd love to do it because uh, this is an evening that I love and I'm becoming, if not already arrived at my destination, passionate about. Uh, I've been to every one of the Eastbourne Baba bars. I, I've yet to get over to the St. Leonard's one. It is very much on my agenda to do so, but sadly are a number of other factors on my agenda. So I'm hoping that there'll be more people that, that come along as the evening progresses. There certainly are a few people I'm expecting to see who aren't here yet, but it is splendid to see some familiar and some new faces. I think we all, hopefully everyone knows the concept of the Baba Bar. It's three people that are brave enough and passionate enough to get up and stand here for 15 minutes talking about a subject they're passionate about um, and then maybe fielding a few questions that are somewhere between relevant and inappropriate. Um, <laughs> so hopefully more towards a relevant end and, uh, and less towards the other end. But anyway, who knows, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, last time we were here, we, we had three speakers. We had Richard, Matt and Mike. Um, who, who gave amazing talks, as all of the talks have been so far at the, uh, at the Babard. Uh, tonight we've got Ruth Ann, who's going to give us a talk on false friends. Uh, we've got Ross, who's going to give us a talk on Lord Haw Haw. Um, he's told me that I'm not to say that it's his passion, because you might end up throwing heavy or blunt objects at him. So um, I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to say that. And then we've got Mike Eccles, who will be the Bamard Bar Eastbourne's first returning performer, because he's already given one talk. Um, his subject tonight is going to be hair, which is a looking around the room is a, is a subject that may be relevant to some of you, but not to all of you. Um, so some may find that engaging, some may find that less so. Uh, that's that's the, the Bavard Bar for the evening. Um, Shall we invite Ruth Ann up to give her talk? Please let us hear about oh. Paul's friends. Sorry, if I stand here, you can see that around. Right? Yeah. Um, how do someone use this? <laughs> Click the right you're, you're asking me? Click the right. The right one, it should. Sorry. It should take Technology. it through. There we go. Uh, there we are. Paul's <laughs> friends are like awkward hand movements. Um, I'm Ruth Ann Garrett and I uh, run an interpreting agency and I also run a not-for-profit community cafe so we've got a bit of a mix going on there um, so false friends is perhaps not what you think it is it's not really about friends it's about interpreting and linguistic concepts but I will start with two stories for you that if you rec anyone recognise this one any Brightonians in there yeah. It's like Mount Caden. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be, isn't it? I googled for a picture of Devil's Day. I don't know. Maybe it's somewhere else. Um, can you guys all hear me alright? Am I talking loud enough? Okay, so there's a few anecdotes just to demonstrate the points that I'm going to talk about for false friends, so just to follow me on the anecdotes. This one was because when I was 18, I was in St. Louis on a very, very cold winter day and with uh, visiting a very religious family who introduced me to their 18-year-old daughter who was also very, very religious. I 
and um, and she had a boyfriend who was in the United States Air Force, and he and his friend said they'd take us out for the night and we could go and sit in some fighter jets. And I was like, at 18, oh my god, this is so cool. I've just met these people, but this is so cool. So we drive into the airbase and they said, you girls stay in the car, we're gonna go, and, I'm not gonna do the American accent, we're gonna go and talk to security and see if they'll let us go and sit in the fighter jets. Okay. Now long story short, they actually did, it was an awesome night. But the interesting bit about the false friend was that the girl turned to me, I've just met this girl half an hour earlier, and she looked at me in the silence and she said, I'm frigid. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> like A, I know she's really religious and she's definitely not supposed to know that she's frigid. <laughs> and B, I had no experience with anything either. I was just like, I don't know what to tell you. And I just sat there and stared, so I'm staring back at her until she fortunately went, it's so cold. Oh. And I went, ah, oh thank God, that's what that means. So yeah, so frigid would be a false friend. In the linguistic term, that's where you think you know what something means, but it doesn't. So even within the same language, across two cultures, we get the same problem. This one is because the same year, a few weeks later, my then boyfriend came out to visit me. I picked him up from LA, it was a bit warmer, LA airport, and we got on the bus, packed bus coming out of LA airport, and they had storm drains on either side of the freeway, at which point he practically jumped out of his seat and went, oh my god, look at that dike! which was another false friend, and the people on the bus were a bit like. So devil's date just doesn't mean the same to the Americans. I know we use it both here. So a false friend is a word that's often confused with a word in another language with a different meaning because the two words look or sound similar. So they have the example in the Cambridge Dictionary of, I, I, excuse my accent if anyone can speak French better and say this one for me, actuellement, I assume, which means currently rather than actually. So when we're trying to speak French, you, you kind of grab onto the words that are a bit like English and you think, oh, they're friends to me, I can use them. But a lot of the time, dangerous friends. So that, that wouldn't be too dangerous, depending on the situation, I suppose. But here's a few more. So dyke we've already covered in American. Sympathetique in French doesn't mean sympathetic. It just means friendly. There's no sense in sympathetique or feeling sorry for someone or understanding their pain. It's purely just unfriendly. Sensible in Spanish, sensible, is, um, is not sensible, it's sensitive rather than sensible. So th th there is a little bit, in English you can sometimes say, ah, oh, he's sensible of that. And if you say someone's sensible of that, that's similar to saying they're sensitive to it. So sometimes we use it, am I making, does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. But that, that definitely means sensitive rather than sensible. So those are still quite, quite tame. Food, ordering food. Okay, if you are in Spain and you see tuna and you order it and you're hoping for fish, edible cactus. That's what you get from you tuna in Spain. Um, if you order pasta in Poland, toothpaste, fantastic. <laughs> and this one, I used to live in Brighton Marina, and I lived up above Bella Napoli, the Italian restaurant, and all the waiters used to love me. They used to fight over each other to serve me, and I never really understood why. Nobody ever asked me out, so it wasn't that kind of thing. But it turned out that I was ordering what I thought was penne pasta, and I didn't know, like literally for years, I would go in there and I would always order a penny pasta. And um, until I went with my Italian au pair who collapsed in hysterics and said, you're saying penis pasta. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? I'm doing it for you. <laughs> so that's why they all giggle every time I order my pasta. Uh, penne for penis has one N and it's penne, whereas this is penne. And it, my friend Jess and I went back to that Italian restaurant and I called on the waiter and said, could you please explain to me the difference between penis and penne? And he said it, and to me they sound identical, so I'm still like... <laughs> <laughs> but it's one end to two ends, and that's that. So now this is getting, now we're getting really more awkward. I'll try not to take too long, but just while we're on the topic. I worked at City College and students Arabic students, every time the girls said, oh, I need to get out some, for some fresh air with collapsing giggles, the Arabic students were. So I took them aside and said, what's going on? What's this problem with the girls asking for fresh air? And they were like, because air, another word for penis, 
<laughs> so Arabic, air means penis. Be careful when you ask for fresh air. Now, my own name. I once married a Persian man. And every time he introduced me to his friends, he would introduce me as Rutan, because they don't have the th sound in Farsi. So it's Rutan, whereas I'm Rutan, but Rutan. And everyone would giggle and always do a little, <laughs> nice to meet you. And in the end, I sort of cornered him and went, what is up with my name? And it turns out, Ru means on top of, and Tan means the body. So every time I was saying Rue Tan, they were like, hi, I'm on top of the body. But in a, in a compromising position. <laughs> Talking of compromising, compromiso in Spanish. Did I pronounce that right? Compa. That's my Spanish coach for this. Compromiso does not mean compromise. Does anyone know this one? No? So this means... Um, to, oh, let me get it completely right. It's to make a commitment. So if you're discussing your relationship with a Spanish partner and they're going, I want to go, I want to marry you, I want to, and you're going, no, 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 let's compromise. Be careful. So that's commitment in Spanish. Yeah. If you're saying in Polish, absolutely, this is absolutely, which means absolutely not. So it's just like completely opposite. And this final one, uh, what would you think, looking at this one, if I say estoy embarazada, I'm embarrassed, I'm pregnant. There's also instances where people have said, English people have said to pregnant Spanish women, congratulations on your embarrassment, because it works the other way around. So you have to be careful on those ones. They said not to be political. It's just a photo. <laughs> Big hot tip. Moustache. There you go. That's all that means. It wasn't your political at all. <laughs> anyway, so it works with those words, those straightforward false friend words, but it, we have cultural false friends as well, where we assume the person we're talking to, when they do something, that they mean what we would mean if we did that thing. Does that make sense? So if they go like that, we assume they mean yes, because in our culture, this is yes, right? Persian restaurants, going back to the Persian ex, um, first date, he sent me up to pay, and the man at the counter knew I was out with a Persian man, and therefore said, no, 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 you don't have to pay. And I went, yeah, thank you so much. And I went back and sat down. At which point, the guy was just like, why haven't you paid? I said, he said not to. He's like, no, no, no. And he ran up to the counter and said, I'm sorry, she's English. You have to tell English people they've just got to pay because they don't understand. And it turns out that in Iran, you have to offer three times. So you say, here's the money. And they go, no, 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 don't pay. You go, no, I must, I must. They go, no, 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 don't pay. No, really, I must pay. No, 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 don't pay. I insist. Okay, thanks. Like, that look for everything. So I really <laughs> have to know that. It's so hard to forget. You just sort of like, so hard to remember. Um, and at Persian husbands, funny enough, you know, he often seemed upset. He's one of my very best friends now, haven't you? He often seemed upset while we were married, and, and I would be like, are you okay? Are you still happy with me? And he seemed to be going, yeah, 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 it's fine. It actually took us like seven years to get divorced, because it took me that long to realize that in Iran, this is no. So, every time I was like, are you fine? He's like, I was like, oh good, that's great. <laughs> so they go, yes and no. So that can be really complicated. I, I'm just using Persian because obviously I had that close relationship, but it's just worth being really aware of all the cultures you come across. This one's awkward. In my defense, I was in my early 20s. I had an African student from Zimbabwe come and stay with us. And she stood in front of my microwave, looking completely lost. So I thought, oh bless, I'll come up, help her. So I came up and I went, it's a microwave. You put food in it and it cooks it really quickly. And you, you turn the dial like this, and then when you close the door, it automatically starts. And she went, yeah, thanks, we have one, but ours is digital. <laughs> I was like, learn my lesson. But an interesting false friend that comes up 
with a lot of African countries, but also Middle Eastern countries. Um, and also, people with certain disabilities is eye contact that often, like for example in English schools, in English schools, if a student won't give you eye contact, it's considered to be insolent and impolite. But in a lot of cultures, to give eye contact is impolite. And avoidance of eye contact is respect for the person you're talking to. So it's that thing where someone's like avoiding your eyes, and you're thinking, oh, they're shifty. Maybe not. You know, maybe they've just come from a culture where eye contact would be defiance. So therefore, it's much more polite to avoid. Eye contact is also really important in the language I mostly translate. I translate British Sign Language. I work with deaf people. Is there anybody here who knows no sign language at all? Anyone? I love this. <laughs> what are you doing right now to tell me that you don't? <laughs> so there's loads of hand signs that aren't necessarily British Sign Language, but that everybody uses. Like this one and this one, yeah, and some body language, but we all know what it means. How many do you reckon there are in, in English sign language? Well, in English hearing sign, hand gestures. How many do you think we use, roughly? Any Ten. guesses? Two. Ten? Two hundred? <laughs> Anyone between <laughs> Less than that, more than that. <laughs> oh, Ninety. Oh, really close. Really close. Between eighty and ninety, oh, distinct oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> Which is when you think, like, Again, Jess and I didn't have oh, surely there can't be that many different ones. We were trying to think up without Googling. We were trying to think of as many as we could think of. So these are, sorry, so these are some of them. So carry on. Everyone kind of knows that. Carry on. <laughs> here. I'm cool. Or oh, now the new one is this. Uh, money. Nosy or keep mum, similar. Yeah, over my head. And what a relief, like. So that's just some of them, but those sorts of things, there's over 80 that we would all recognise. That's including, like they said, if you're standing like that, it's not a particular sign because you might just be comfortable. But if you went, that's a particular, that means something that we'd recognise. Italians! How many hand signs do you think Italians use? <laughs> you were close with that one. They reckon over 250 Italian signs that every Italian would recognise. So it's, it's like really in the language. And um, here's some that the guys in the restaurant told me. In fact, about half of them are I'm bored, let's go, which might tell you a little something about Italians. They've got like 100 ways of saying I'm bored, let's leave. I like this one. You can teach all your friends this. This is like, come on, let's get out of here. I want to go. And then maybe with people that you don't like, you see like, stand each other. This is good luck. Like that. But if you do it this way, like rock on in English, that's quite cool, isn't it? Here, that means your wife is unfaithful. But it's perhaps not such a nice language. <laughs> then rock on in Italy. <laughs> Similarly, thumbs up, fine in Italy, fine here. Greece, that's about where you're going to speak it. So, lots and lots of countries can't do the thumbs up. Why does it matter? Loftus and Palmer, 1974, did this amazing experiment where they showed people clips of a car crash. And they asked them questions, and the only thing they changed between the two groups that they asked. They asked one about what happened when you saw the car's impact, and the others, what happened when you saw the car's smash. So similar words, but different words. And then they asked them later on in the questions, did you see broken glass? There was no broken glass on either clip. But on the one where they said smash, almost everyone reported seeing broken glass, because the question had been asked with the word smash. So therefore they assumed something must be smashed, Therefore, they said they saw broken glass. So when you start thinking about witnesses giving evidence in court, working through an interpreter who might be picking up on false friends, it, it's really, really risky things. People's lives are like really dependent on interpreters going, is that actually a word I want to use? Sign language, a couple of examples where it's gone badly wrong. This one was one where the lady, this was years ago, 
Um, the lady had spent her tax money that she should have paid, her council tax, and she was in court to answer why she hadn't paid her council tax. They were like, what did you do with your benefit money? Why didn't you pay council tax? And she said this and this, which she meant was drinking essentials, so food and drink for my family, and feeding the electricity meter. And the interpreter interpreting for her said she spent it on alcohol and playing dance. <laughs> and no one picked it up because in those days they didn't have interpreters that check. Now we have three people working, we have one resting, one signing, and one watching, and we rotate. But in that time it was one interpreter in court, and that was that. So if they said whatever they wanted to say, that was that. Holding the knife is an interesting one. A, a prosecution might say holding the knife and mean something entirely different to the defense saying, defense to say holding the knife. Because in English, it's really generic. You can just say, I held the knife, or I killed him. But you can't in sound language. You have to know how you killed him, which means as an interpreter, you ask really awkward questions like, how exactly do you mean that person was murdered? You know, because is it, is it killed, or was it killed, or was it killed? Or you know, there's all these different, and holding the knife could be holding the knife, or it could be holding the knife, or it could be holding the knife. Like, there's so many different ways that that's got to get the extra detail. In it. And the other thing that was interesting is they, um, some research, Christopher Stone, what's the guy's name, um, did research about how sign language interpreters tend to reduce the meaning, simplify the meaning of long English words for deaf people. So if the prosecutor said, I assume, in sign language, you would have to sign. He thinks that he knows what you were going to say. But there's not time to do that, so you just sign, I think. But it, it doesn't mean I assume, like it's a false friend again. And it can make a real difference in a court case. So that's good. There are some nice things. Last week was um, Transgender Pride in Brighton. And people were talking with me about the sign for transgender which used to be the sign for transvestite. And whereas the, the trans community have changed that word transvestite into transgender, the sign hasn't changed. And they said, do you, do you update sign language in the same way to make it more polite? And to, but the thing is, we always sign meaning, and this means a change of heart. So it never did have those connotations of transvestite anyway. It was always just a change of heart. So for transgender, it's a change of heart. So it's, it's just staying through. It's, it's, kind of, it's got the nice bit to it. Am I still alright for time? I've got five more minutes. Okay, come on. This is The Hague. This was, at that time, the highlight of my career. I was so excited to be booked to interpret The Hague. All the spoken language interpreters sit in these little booths here. And um, just a side note, one really interesting thing I learned from one of the sign language interpreters there is that humour will not translate. So they are taught to say, the German Chancellor is just telling a joke, so if you could please laugh on the count of three, two, one, and they go, <laughs> and then they carry on, they just don't even bother with the humour, it's just laugh to be polite and normally move, all the certain language interpreters do that. But we have to stand on the stage, so I was here on stage, and whoever was lecturing was here, and all this section was filled with deaf people. Now, they're facing forwards. They can't hear all the people behind them, and they're just focused on me. And I think there was something there, there's about 100 deaf people, and maybe about 2,500 in the room. And they just sort of neglected the fact that there were a lot of people there, and, and they just sort of focused on me. So I started signing, and about 10 minutes into it, two women sitting on the front row started going to me, like that, pointing I was like, oh my god, there's a spider on my head, or something terrible is going to happen. And I was like, but the guy's still speaking, I'm supposed to be sad, so I had to say sorry to all the deaf people. Like, sorry, hold that, I'll come back to it. And then I looked at these two women and I went, what? So I what at them? And they went, God, this thing's like parting, it's really cool. How did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I don't know how. what are you doing? <laughs> Just went really talk later in the break, and they went, oh, <laughs> anyway, carry on. But they really put me off. And some signs are really close to each other. So we've got beard, goat, Jew, and man. I'm just going to do them again so you can see they are different. Beard, right? Goat, Jew, and man. 
unfortunately, just after those women said that, I turned back to hear what the guy was saying, and he, I missed why he was saying it. He was telling a story about a small, fat goat. <laughs> they had come up and bit him on the butt, basically, on his trouser leg, so I signed that a small, fat Jewish man, <laughs> without being aware of it, I was like, fat Jewish man, he bit me on the, and a hundred deaf people went, <laughs> so that was pretty tense. So that was the highlight. What I thought was going to be the best day ever. I was like, no, no, not good. Um, so, be careful with this science. You might think that you could just, you know, you can finger spell the alphabet, okay? I, I'm just going to teach you five letters from the alphabet. If you hold up your left hand, if you're right handed, so you've got pen and paper, if you're left handed, pen in your left hand, right hand your paper. See what I mean? Paper and pen. It's from the thumb. A, E, I, O, U. They're the vowels. Really easy, right? A, E, I, O, U. My first husband was called Guy. And I took him, to see how quickly you get what's going to happen, to meet my deaf friends in the pub for the first time. And he was so proud that he'd learned the alphabet. You remember this is A here, right? And you down here, right? And um, so he came into this big gathering and he was like, I'm, I'll tell them, I'll tell them, I'll tell them. I was like, go on then. And he went, because they can't hear him saying it. His name was Guy. And, uh, and my very flamboyant um, gay deaf friend went, oh, me too, me too, come and sit by me. <laughs> was like, these people are not really friendly. <laughs> yes. So my final point of warning on false friends is actually the real type of false friend. Have you ever been, and I think probably quite a few of you would have done, in a situation where you're trying to learn a language and someone says to you, oh yeah, yeah, this is what that means, and they're lying. Have you ever had that? Because I'm always trying to learn other languages and this and that to my world. Um, but I'm going to tell you story about someone else because I've done enough embarrassing stories tonight. City College again, late evening, I was the assistant in a class with a deaf lecturer and all deaf, deaf um, students. So I was the only hearing person and I wasn't in charge by any means. I just ran to get the paper and did phone with I was in the lift with them all and a lady got on who worked in student support. And um, she worked with adults with special needs. So she kind of had this thing that if they were deaf, I was obviously in charge they weren't. Does that make sense? Because she, when she worked with people that signed it was adults with special needs, so she was in charge. So she said to me, oh, you've got all your deaf students, that's nice. And they were all kind of like looking at her and looking at me. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm working in a class with deaf students and a deaf tutor, you know. And, uh, and she said, I've learned some sign language. And I went, oh, that, that's nice, that's nice. And all the deaf people still just looked at her. They were all around and she'd stepped in and the doors had closed behind her. She said, my students taught me a really good sign. I said, oh, that, that's good, that really nervous already, just by the way she just wasn't aware. And she said, um, they taught me unicorn. And I thought, no, I just know what's going to happen. And uh, I went, oh, oh, that's interesting. She sort of waited for me to ask her to sign it. And I was like, no, not going to ask, not going to ask. So then the doors opened at her, her level, and she stepped backwards. So the doors were open, and this whole lift full of deaf people, and she went, <laughs> and then the doors closed. <laughs> and they all looked at me and went, what? <laughs> so sometimes people will lie to you when they're telling you something. It's unicorn, by the way, just the ones, not repeated. <laughs> Rhinoceros, just the ones, and coffee, just the ones. <laughs> the subject title of false friends I had no idea <laughs> but, but, but that was going to be uh, what, what what came out I, I, I personally quite like the, um, the Iranian restaurants where I think I'd probably ask for the bill and then run uh, <laughs> and, and then just leave because um, I've asked for the bill and I've done my bit <laughs> does anyone have any questions for Ruth Ann because I, I thought that was amazing 
I, I, well, well, the whole thing is really amazing anyway, but how you can just stand up there and, and just keep talking? <laughs> I mean, how can you do that? <laughs> It's my job, of course, so I stand up and talk. It's, it's so interesting. It's so interesting. I'm sorry, I have no questions. How long before you became fluent in sign language to be learned? Um, my dad was a social worker when I was little. And um, so one Saturday in a barbecue, loads of deaf people came and taught me sign language. I think I was about eight. Um, and I always remembered those signs they taught me that day, so I probably learned the alphabet and stuff that day. Um, and used to love it, use it as a secret code with my other friends at school and stuff. So I think I kind of learned it that way, but that really limited amount. But I got really good at the alphabet. And then, um, so then I must have been, it was about 2000 that I started signing, but I got like complete immersion. So, so from the moment I met deaf people for the next four weeks, I, did, I didn't speak, I just, except for to my children. I just signed, oh, my son said. He was tiny at the time. So other than speaking to him, I didn't meet any hearing people from when I met my first deaf person. About four weeks, I was just with deaf people. And, um, and after the four weeks, someone came up to me and went, oh, are you level two? Which is like two years worth of, so it really shows how total immersion really, you know, I was sleeping long every night and having headaches, but so for me it was quite quick to get being able to have a conversation. I think in other languages, if you don't know a word, you're stuck, and in sign language you can spell it. So you just start off using the alphabet a lot, and every time you spell a word, the deaf person feeds you that word. So there's, there's no, you know, you, you're not like tripping up as you go, you're just being annoying to the deaf people. <laughs> so, it's, so it's, but maybe like two years to fluency normally. If you're going, you know, if you're going to class one night a week, it's about two years. Without the immersion. Without the immersion. So, so, so probably the time I spent was the equivalent of one night a week for two years because it was full for weeks. But they say that when you come to a language, you start dreaming in it. Did you start? Yeah, you can. involve the, like the sound yeah, sometimes I do it now, and then when I wake up, I realise it was complete gibberish. Like I don't <laughs> in my dreams. I'm like, just like not real sign language at all. So I have, maybe I haven't even reached that point yet. <laughs> Seventeen years old. Um, it's slightly off topic, but it's still my favourite sign language I've heard before. But I think you will enjoy it. Um, could you just bring up a story about um, when you went to the conference with? Um, Andy and learn about uh, schizophrenia and so, okay. Oh, um, oh yeah. So I went to a mental health of deaf people conference and was amazed to hear a deaf psychologist talking about her research. And um, not here, she was signing. Um, and um, she was saying that her research has shown that um, deaf schizophrenics see disembodied hands signing. So you know when people hear voices, deaf people will see hands, will hallucinate hands in the same way that hearing people will hear voices. Wow. Yeah, it's fascinating. This is the dream question links to that one. Yeah, 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 that's really is fascinating. Is sign language transferable? Because you, you said about that we've got eight, between 80 and 90 in English and, and the Italian we've got 250. So are the, the, the English hand gestures transferable into Italian or um, do they just... No, only a few. Only right. if it's, again, it, sometimes it's false friends. So, like deaf sign language, they have this sign, which you will think means something, but it means holiday. So, so it's the similar thing that there will be some that means good, and to you it means good, yes. and that means good in Italy. So some of them. So there are words, actually but there's others language there. interpretations that are different. Than yeah. Wow. And um, uh, England and Australia and New Zealand and Scotland have the same sign language. England, Scotland, Wales, Australia, New Zealand, and France, Ireland, and the USA and Canada have the same, but they're different from each other. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, American yeah. deaf people feel linguistically close to French people, and, and, and Australian deaf people feel close to British people. It's that kind of. Yeah. I shouldn't say British because Irish is different, but too. I was just going to say, the thing you taught me that I thought was quite interesting that no one else will know, which is that that is... That's good, yes, but that's but also that's good. good as well. This is good, whichever way you hold it in sign language, and that's bad. So beautiful, okay. <laughs> healthy, ill.
So, so the bad comes with the little finger. That's um, I just that but that four weeks I spent with people was just friends. I just made friends. I've lost I've lost a load of friends. That's a whole other story. I got thrown out of a cult, but we can go into that. <laughs> <laughs> um, That'll be another talk. Sorry, so I was like, oh, yes, excommunicated communicated from every friend I've had before, and suddenly the deaf community just picked me up like the day that happened. So. Um, so I just was friends with them for three or four years, and then when my son started going to school and I needed a job, all my deaf friends were like, you should be an interpreter. So, so it's very much on a social level to start with. Well, that was utterly, yeah. utterly yeah. brilliant, I think. Um, everyone will agree. A huge round of applause. Ten minutes or so.